The T2 Tile project is building an indefinitely scalable computational stack. Follow our progress here on T Tuesday Updates. So this is the new Common Data Manager. It's actually the uh, Common Data Manager status panel in MFM T2. It's not the Common Data Manager itself. Common Data Manager doesn't actually have much of a user interface. But this is running in some super fast time lapse. It's like two hours uh, running compressed down into half a minute or something like that. Uh, but it's working and a lot of new stuff is there. Uh, so I want to talk today about how uh, we got there and, and some of the challenges we had along the way. Uh, this is what it looks like now. So this is a couple of hours later after the Common Data Manager has finished moving the uh, MFM engine, which is like a 15 megabyte file from uh, this guy, this uh, tile up here, uh, to its southwest and its southeast. And you know, it took forever. It took. <laughs> It took hours, but you know, the CDN is not the main event, it's the background. And in fact, at the same time, all of that was going on. Oh, here, this is the new interface uh, where we have the, the CDM status panel, which is what we were looking at. But at the same time, in the background, see if we can find that there, look at that. Uh, uh, there was a uh, type one uh, bean. Uh, wandering around this little universe the whole time. And that's the point, that we're going to be uh, willing to take extra time for the uh, CDM to do its business because, in general, we want the underlying laws of physics to be changing relatively rarely. And this, once we climb that far up the stack, is going to be what it's all about. So that's where we're at as far as it goes. Uh, I want to drill down into it a little bit just because, you know, of course, I didn't expect to spend as much time on it in the last two weeks. Did some other stuff, but did mostly this. Um, but it's uh, it's back and it's better than ever, uh, um, even though... <laughs> Uh, at the moment, the, kind of the original point of doing the whole CDM revisit was to do pipelined transfers where it could flood through a whole bunch of them at once. Uh, we're still heading for that, but first it was time to clean up uh, the original version and make it something that was more suitable for so, some software engineering. And this happens a lot. When you're trying to build a whole new stack, you're going to have this process, or at least I'm going to have this process, I do have this process of trying to reach for a bunch of behavior in a spike, in a quick program just to learn the issues, get the lay of the land, see what I really want, what I actually can have, what I need to give up right away, and what maybe I can have if I try some uh, more engineering. And so the first version of CDM, the first two versions of CDM, in terms of the underlying wire protocol that CDM is using, this is now version three, uh, um, but <coughs> it's, it's, well, let me show you. Uh, so the original, this is the little directory uh, <laughs> of the, the first two, well, the previous CDM. And CDM.pl, that's the whole thing that, that does the, uh, the exchanging data, the announcing files, and seeing who's got newer and older ones, and so on and so forth. 43 kilobytes of Perl code to do it. A and what it looks like now is this. Uh, uh, there's still a cdm.pl file. I don't know if you can see it up here, uh, uh, right there. And it's 784 bytes. Uh, uh, but there's all this other stuff, uh, which is in total 100,000 bytes, 100 kilobytes, 104 kilobytes of stuff. So it's somewhat more than double. Um, but everything is broken out as best I could. I tried to be really squeaky clean about it. Say, you know, if there's a different function, make a different module, make a different class, express the relationships as best you can. And it's already been paying off. It's already been, you know, when I, when there's a bug or when that's clear that, that we need to be doing something else that we're not doing, much more often there's a specific place that ought to be responsible for it. Not just where was it happened to be implemented, but it ought to be the time queue. It ought to be the T, the transfer manager traditional, the TM traditional is dealing with it or whatever it is. So in the original code, 
uh, even though you know it had a bunch of stuff there, it also had a lot of things like this uh, in the whole you know load up the list of deleted files right it, when you're sharing common data one of the real challenges is how do you delete stuff and normally if you just delete a file then someone else says hey here's another copy of it so <clears throat> we had this scheme to keep a list <clears throat> of all the files that have been deleted so that once we delete them everybody would consult the list and they would not take a new copy they would not offer a new copy if it was on the list of deleted files <coughs> and in fact that list of deleted files gets itself packed into one of these mfz files and passed around but the original cdm the cdm that we had until two weeks ago uh, you know when it was time to update the deleted files <coughs> it, it printed a little message so uh, there was a, a bunch of stuff that wasn't really there this is the new code it's got an express place where it's supposed to run hooks for when files have been loaded into a cdm or when files have been released to disk we have a uh, when the commands cdm deleted file has been loaded we run the hook we register the hook on our hook manager you know, <laughs> try to be as careful as I could everything in its place uh, um, and then all through it you know <clears throat> uh, there's all the various stuff that you have to do if a file's coming by we need to check if the thing has been deleted uh, uh, if there's a file that has been sitting in pending which means it's just been received by by somebody else and we're going to now promote it up to common the CDM common directory which is where everybody is supposed to agree on what's there we shouldn't promote it if it turns out it's deleted or if it got deleted in the meantime etc and the, the file itself, uh, each individual file actually has uh, events and timeouts and it is able to sort of be active and it's really emerging that this, this, this idea of you have, you know, sort of interacting agents kind of like actors for people who are familiar with a kind of programming model called the actor model and then you have timeouts and uh, everything has to be designed so that if timeouts come at a weird time then it, they will either not disrupt things or everybody will be ready to tolerate it so it all works out and CDM control uh, uh, which existed but was very limited is now much more limited it still only has a few commands delete add another file and it help uh, list deleted uh, um, and we can you know if we look in the guts of it oh yeah this this was a nice trick didn't exist until this past two weeks CDM deleted.mfz. That's the name of the file that contains the list of files that's been deleted. So here's a nice little piece of code uh, in CDM control today. It, it doesn't let you delete CDM deleted.mfz, uh, which, you know, have I ever actually done it? I haven't, but now I can't. So a lot of it. Uh, and now we've actually got a few uh, files that I put in the thing that are deleted files. So newstyle.msc was something that I was using for testing. Most of these are testing. CDM distrib T2 GFB is something that goes back over a year. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually unable to get rid of. Uh, we're not. We're not using GFB. It, it was a thing for doing graphics that that ended up not using. Uh, but you know, I, I would think I had gotten rid of it, and then I would plug in some old tile that hadn't been updated since forever, and it would start spreading its <laughs> distrib T two GFB around because we didn't actually have the deleted stuff working. Now it's in the deleted file, <sighs> uh, um, and so on. And you know. So uh, new style as of, you know, uh, 15 br 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 TSM as of, you know, so what are those numbers? Those numbers are the number of seconds since midnight January 1st, 1970, I think, something like that. And the point of it is, is that when we delete a file, we're deleting it from some specific moment in time. We're saying, because the file named test.msc might have many incarnations. So when we say, I want to delete test.msc, what we are really saying, we want to delete it as of this time and earlier. Anything earlier than that is, we, we don't want it. If there's a new one called test.msc that has a newer time stamp, associated with it then it's a separate issue and that's what those numbers are numbers of seconds since uh, the epoch since 1970 notice anything weird uh, about those things I mean aside from the fact that they're big and they're you know 1.6 billion seconds seems like a lot of seconds but then 1970 seems like a long time ago and you know 
every single MFC file has one of these things in her timestamp. There it is. There's another one. Is there anything weird about that timestamp? Uh, uh, you know, they're, oh, they're all about the same. 1.6 billion because we're all in the same year. Uh, um, there's some from our uh, little pink boxes that we saw a week or so ago. Again, uh, you know, 159. Anything weird about them? See anything weird about them? I never saw anything weird about them until the last two weeks. Uh, uh, and there's another one from the uh, last video. So, I'm going to tell the story <laughs> of one of my bugs. Uh, and by way, by way of learning a little bit about the MFC file and how this kind of stuff works, uh, as well as just because, you know, this is the T-Tuesday update, and this took some time. Uh, uh, so the way an MFZ file works, it's based on zip files. That's what the Z in MFC stands for, Movable Feast Zip. Uh, um, and the way it works is it takes all of your files, and it wraps them up in a zip file called the inner zip, and that's what uh, inner zip is for. And then then it uses your private key, or in the case of the stuff for the tile, it uses the special key that is associated that, that is compiled into the code to be accepted, so that the tile, all the tiles, will accept code that has been signed by this particular uh, handle, uh, uh, and it signs the inner. Uh, zip file and then it wraps that whole thing in another outer zip file and then writes that whole thing out okay so it's like you know Russian nesting dolls it, it's your files that in fact are wrapped up in a tar file and that whole thing is wrapped up in a zip the zip is signed and then that whole thing is wrapped up in another zip file along with the signature information and some other uh, information about the whole thing uh, um, now the new version uh, the make inner zip, it's the same thing as before, but here's what it is. I wanted to have a announcement packet. This is one of the things I realized was kind of wrong about the previous version, especially when going to pipelining, was that, uh, you know, you could announce this file saying, you know, I got a file, it's this long, here's my timestamp for it, trust me. Uh, and in particular, not don't trust me just until it gets to you, which is the way the one hop, the traditional stuff works, but trust me just because I say the checksum of the first whatever is this, you should just go and do it. So what I wanted instead was to be able to say, here's some information, name of the file, the timestamp of the file, a checksum of the file, summarizing it all up. I wanted that to be signed by the same authority that was signing the inner zip. But we were going to take that signature and we were going to smash it all down small enough that it could be in a single packet so that when we announce from one CDM to another saying, hey, I've got this thing, we're actually sending something with a cryptographic signature in the single packet that the receiver can then check and say, oh, okay, well, you know, maybe I'm, someone stole the key and this is all being messed up, but I'm no worse off trusting this announcement packet than I was trusting the whole MFC when I got it one hop. That's what's going on here. So in order to do that, I needed to be able to predict what the inner timestamp was going to be <laughs> so that I could put the same timestamp in the announcement packet that came in the thing. So the idea was was that the inner zip uh, code that I wrote, uh, I changed it to also you know give me back whatever the inner time was so that we could go ahead and, and when we make this announcement packet, this was the, a whole new feature, put the inner time in it, sign the announcement packet, give me back the announcement packet, and then when when we make the outer zip, we include this signed announcement packet in it as well. And that was great, except I couldn't get it to work. It worked sometimes, but not uh, other times. I couldn't figure out why I was going crazy. Eventually, I came up with a workaround, but I didn't understand why it worked. And so, you know, go to the documentation. I am using, this is written in Perl, and one of the reasons I'm writing it in Perl is because it has so many libraries of all kinds of great stuff that you want to use. Uh, uh, this in particular one, I'm using IO Compress Zip, uh, uh, along with a bunch of crypto stuff. And, uh, you know, you read the documentation more closely, and you find, hey, time number. Set the last modified time field in the zip header to number. Hey, that's handy. But, hey, I don't even need to do that. The field defaults to the time the IO Zip object was created. So that's what I did. I would just get the time myself, the number of seconds since New Year's 1970, uh, um, and then use that as the time. And, you know, it, I, as long as the compression thing didn't happen in the next second, it ought to be all right. But it wasn't. It would work sometimes and not other times. So finally, I broke down and said, okay, well, I'll use the time equals whatever, uh, and I'll pass, I'll, I'll get the time myself, I'll pass it in and say, use this. 
And again, it works sometimes, not the rest. And eventually, and so here it was. So here's my new revised code where I pick the time by calling, you know, give me the number of times, a moment since, since the second since the epoch, pass it into this thing, pass it into everybody, and it didn't work. Didn't work. The hack that I finally figured out was that if the if the assigned time was even, it worked. All of those times, all the times in the pink boxes, all the times in all of the timestamps and all the verified stuff, I'd never noticed it before. They're all even. And so once I made the code always do even timestamps, well then it worked. And finally, after I diagnosed it, then I could find out by, you know, Googling around what's going on. Zip entry timestamps are recorded to only two second precision. This reflects the accuracy of DOS timestamps when the thing was created. So there it is. There's the answer. In the land of DOS, every single bit was expensive, so the timestamp was recorded the number of seconds in the day and the number of days. And the number of seconds in the day was recorded in two bytes, which is 16 bits, which can only go up to 65,000, but there's 86,000 seconds in one day, so they use two second granularity. Which, you know, okay. History is always with us, uh, just like the evolutionary history of all the crazy stuff that we have, because that's just the way it used to be done. There it is. Wouldn't have killed the documentation folks to mention this somewhere. And so there it is. Uh, uh, 1597, 884, 526, all of our identifying numbers for the life of the T2 tile project are going to be even. So, okay, uh, um, that's mostly <laughs> what I was doing. Uh, ben, uh, our latest LCF nerd, uh, uh, actually joined a while ago and things got kind of messed up, so I apologize for that. Uh, it's possible that we may have a mechanism to improve our uh, email flow for the future. Who knows? We'll see. We'll find out about that. I thought also I just wanted to run uh, past a few of the other projects that are out there because folks might not know about them, and there's a lot of very cool stuff happening. Uh, um, so. Uh, oh yeah, and this was the the latest thing that that Strider, uh, who you know I've known since a long time, uh, uh, has been working on MFMS on the actual major code base to in part to get it converted to SDL2, a more version, a more recent version of the graphics libraries, and he had a report. Uh, uh, so um, I got the MFM now uses the SDL2 library, which is the library that uh, synthesizer app that plays frequencies <clears throat> on the IMAP Amino to 440 because I think of them as notes, but you can drop these things on there and they play their little sounds when they're processed. And so, uh, yeah, I was kind of happy with the way it came out. It was funny, man. <laughs> so, so that's pretty funny. I, I enjoyed that. Uh, um, uh, I'll put a link to the video below. You know, what exactly to do with Adam's making sound, who knows. But uh, after we get stuff working, we're going to need to get stuff interacting with the world because that's what this computational model is about. It's not about the platonic, you know, input output mean nothing. It's about being part of systems that are coupled to the actual world that they're physically located in. Uh, also, uh, Luke Wilson has been working on this sand pond thing. Let me show you a little bit of his stuff. Uh, um, Luke Wilson posts stuff on, I see it on Twitter, I guess it's on Instagram also. This looks like 2D. He's doing like parallel event windows, but the underlying engine is 3D. Well, let's see. I'm not exactly sure how this works. All right, there's sand. And we could... Uh, I don't know, melt it with lava maybe? I guess I'm not sure if that's melting it or not. Um, laser, yeah. There we go. Uh, and there's some way to grow the... Oops, that's not it. Ah, uh, here we go. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> Take a laser shower, buddy. So, very cool, um, and uh, the latest stuff with the event windows, he's kind of looking towards, uh, I think, 
GPU stuff, which you know is is really great for folks that try to speed up little finite scale demos, and and can't can't not look at the community without talking about uh, MFM rocks. So we'll end with that. And we can't forget MFM rocks. Andrew Walpole is the great grand bean of accessible uh, um, uh, MFM-like simulators. Uh, it's been essentially continuous development for, I don't know, a year or two now, and at least. These are the cell membranes uh, that he's got. Uh, this is the, uh, there's a, a million things you can play with. You can put them all <laughs> together. Super swap worm. I don't even really understand how that works either, but uh, it sends back uh, little pulses to shorten up the end. Uh, here I, I hit the times 10 button here to just get it so it becomes a little jerky but goes faster. Uh, I don't know what the heck happened, uh, <laughs> um, but there's an awful lot you can do to train your eyes just by playing around with these things about how asynchronous bottom-up uh, parallel organizations uh, can exist and form and live and die. So uh, uh, some of the things going on uh, around the community, folks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming in and taking a look. Uh, um, this is, you know, number two of leaning into nerd, giving more detail, being absolutely specific about what's going on. Uh, if other people find the project, that's great. But, you know, we, we've got an awful lot of history, the folks that have come along this far. I'm hoping next week that we'll have the pipelining not just working, but working. Uh, um, and we'll be back to intertile uh, debugging. Uh, we shall see. Have a good two weeks. <laughs>